came to Blown Up on Wednesday night. If you see Letitia, I think she's in, is Letitia in kids' church today? She's in Upbeat today. If you see her, she's got longer gray hair. She still looks a little wild-eyed from all that. Yeah, if you see her, she was in charge of all of the explosions, did an incredible job. Man, I don't know. I, I, I've never seen her so, uh, so in her element. She was out there just walking around. It was just like, man, that was... How many of you, how many of you the uh, fireworks show exceeded your expectation? Yeah, come on, yeah. I know so many people say, I thought we were just going to like a backyard fireworks show. I didn't know, (laughs) y'all. Man, what a great, great time. Well, it's been an amazing week. I don't know, have you had a good week? Yeah, Yeah, three of y'all have. How about the rest of y'all? Yeah. I've had an amazing week. We had blown up. Uh, Aaron and Ryan had a baby. I know. Yeah. They're, uh, they're at the house recuperating. Y- y'all want to see a picture? Yeah. Yeah. Want to see a picture? Aww. I could go on and on, but I'm just promised I'd only do one. No, I'm just doing one. Just doing one. Plus, I don't know what's up with these, these new first-time parents. They're being all stingy with photos. They're like, oh, no, no we, we got to post first. And I'm just like, good grief. I got my own phone. I'm going to poke. Man, I tell you what, it is a good day. It is a good week. It's a good year. Can anybody say amen? Amen. Amen. Man, Porter Birkins is here. The nursery, y'all better. There was a kid crying over there a minute ago. They ain't heard nothing. Wait till Porter gets in there. He's going to straighten them out. He's going to put the teachers in line. He's going to be passing out snack packs to everybody. It's going to be something. That little kid, he's going to take over the universe. I, I don't, is that picture still up? I don't know. I, 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 do, I, do, I do fully acknowledge that because he's my grandson, I feel like he's better looking than the average child. But can we just all agree, that is a good looking kid right there. Yeah, thank you very much. Even, I, know, I know your kid's beautiful too. You have the most beautiful baby as well, but, but that kid, right? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm a little proud. I'm just a little proud. Yeah. I get to go see him again today. Uh, we, got pl- we got camping trips planned, fishing trips. Uh, you, know, just, you know, I've already got the fun started for his dirt bike. His mom, I still haven't got her on board with that yet, but we're working on stuff, you know. So it's going to be, he's going to be one spoiled kid. Let me just tell you that. So when he's rotting and he's kicking you in the shin, and I'm just like, wasn't that the best kick you've ever gotten in your life? You know, just, just understand. <laughs> just under, that's what grandpas do, right? They just get to spoil kids. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, you ready to get to, to get to the preaching? Yeah. Awesome. I'm so glad you guys are here. I'm, I'm just, I know God is doing a new thing in our church. Can you feel that? Is that just, yeah. There's just a new excitement, a new, man, there's just this fresh, whew, it's just good. It's good. May 1st, man, God just began to speak to me. He's speaking to me this whole last year as I was going through some struggles. But, man, May 1st, things changed in me. And, uh, and he just gave me a new word, and he told me to take off that, that, that coat of heaviness and put on the garment of praise. And then he said, that thing don't fit you well anyway. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and he just began to speak into my life and uh, just new things. And, and part of that... Part of that was about a three-day thing when I was just praying and fasting, and part of that, uh, he told me he told me that the old thing, the old glory of this church will pale in comparison to the future glory. Man, and I've hung on to that. I believe that, and and I don't know how long you've been a part of the uprising, but we've had some really good stuff happen. We've had some powerful moves of God, but. That is, we, that's not what we're going to be remembered by. That's not what we're going to remember. We're going to remember the things that haven't even happened yet. And man, that excites me. I'm just, I couldn't be more excited. Uh, yeah, so I just want to start off with a statement and remind you that God promises, He has promised to end our drought. Come on. God has promised, let me, let me put it on me personally, God promised me He's going to end my drought. And, then, and I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. 
And so if, he's, if it's going to rain on me, guess what? It's going to rain on you. And if it rains on you, then you can say, God is going to end my drought also. Amen? Amen. Amen. I don't, does anybody, does, does that resound? Does anybody going through some dry stuff? I don't know if you've been going through some dry stuff, but if you want to, that's great. But if you're going through some dry stuff, you're just kind of like, you know, I'm not saying you're like, you know, living for the devil. You know, you ain't doing like seances in your backyard or nothing. You know, I'm not saying that. You know, I mean, that, that's, because that's not dry. That's exciting stuff. It's just devil stuff, right? I mean, you're all, you know, if you're, I've, I've met people that are, you know, devil worshipers, and, and sometimes they're, they're a lot more exciting than some of us Christians are. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I better fix my microphone. I don't think, I don't, I think, some, I think somebody else is talking, not me. Uh, but some of us, sometimes we get, we get in this dry place, and maybe, maybe you're in a dry place in your, in your walk with God. I Man, I'm here to tell you today, the drought is over. The drought is over. Man, you know, I don't, I, sometimes, even though, you know, it's dry and you're, you know, when I think about dry stuff, I just, it just makes me feel like my bones are getting hurting. Just, you ever get that where, where you're just tired and maybe you haven't been eating well and, you know, your, your elbows are getting inflamed and your, your hips ain't acting right and your knee is going south on you. You're, you know what I'm talking about? But man, when God said, when he says, when he says, I'm going to break the drought off, he's not just talking about it's going to rain, you better get your umbrella ready. He's talking about it's not just going to rain on the outside, but it's going to rain on the inside. And the, that dryness and that weary spirit and that heaviness and that burden. Man, I'm here to tell somebody, today God is going to break that series of drought in your life, and he is going to... Pour His Spirit inside of you, and you're going to feel fresh and new. Does anybody need that? Man, I need that. that I, I, some of y'all are just like, no, nah, I'm good. I got pizza. <laughs> well, that's why we're here. That's why I'm going to preach about that. You know, you start off saying where we're going to go, and then i got to try to get you there, and then at the end we're going to be there, okay? And then some of y'all are going to go along for the ride, and some of y'all, I know how it is. Some of y'all going to leave and just be dry and crucky and cratchy and all crotchety and all mean and grumpy. And, and we're going to be all like, and you'll be, and you'll be like, I don't know why they're so happy. <laughs> man, May 1st. It's my sister's birthday too. Man, God told me I'm going to restore everything. And he had already been doing it and I hadn't even really seen it. I mean, just physical things. He had been restoring things. You know, money that I lost, things that I lost, you know, possessions, things that, that in the grand scheme of things don't really matter. But he'd been already putting stuff back and restoring things. And man, then I, when I saw what he was doing in the physical, man, it just gave me faith to know if he's doing it in the physical, he can do it in the spiritual. And man, what a blessing when God begins to pour his blessings in your life. Amen? Amen. Well, let's get started. I got like 14 pages of notes. Uh, you know, I hope you brought your pillow and your coffee. Your, no, I'm just, I'm just playing. I do have a lot to cover, though. Uh, Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. This is the promise God gave me on May 1st. Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. It says, The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And in this place, I will bring peace. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. And that is a powerful word. Joel chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. It says, Rejoice, you people of Jerusalem. And I know we don't live in Jerusalem, but when it says Jerusalem, you can say, well, I'm not Jewish and that, that's not for me. Or you can say, man, I'm going to claim that one too. Amen? And if you say that, then this is for you. So rejoice, you people of Jerusalem. Rejoice in the Lord your God. For the rain he sends demonstrate his faithfulness. Once more, the autumn rains will come as well as the rains of spring. The threshing floors will again be piled high with grain. And the presses will overflow with new wine and olive oil, says the Lord. And here it is. I will give you back what you lost. Hallelujah. Has anybody lost anything? I mean, maybe you lost your keys. Lord, in Jesus' name, let my mom find her keys. We were searching for keys the other day. Now, have you ever lost your phone? We talked about this last week, man. You can spot the person that's lost their phone because they're just fidgety. They're just like this. All, they're just keep, you know, they've checked their pockets 20 times. You know, maybe it's going to magically appear. But here's the thing. If we're not careful, we'll lose things that, that the enemy comes and he will steal our peace. He will steal our joy. And we've talked about this, you know, before. He doesn't, he doesn't just come in in one instant and just take everything from you. The, the Bible says, 
excuse me. The Bible says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that, that word steal doesn't mean just that he just comes in with a gun and you know it's him. It, it means filch. It means he just takes a little bit. He doesn't take all of your joy. He just takes a little bit. And then he takes a little bit more. And then he takes a little bit of your peace. And then he takes a little bit more of your peace. And he takes, you know, all, you, you, you just miss 30 minutes of sleep. And then you miss an hour of sleep. And then before you know it, you can't sleep at all. And he's just slowly taking things. And he does it slow so that you don't know it's him. But man, when you realize, when you begin to look back and you go, man, I hadn't slept all week. That's not God. That's the devil. But I'm telling you today, God is going to restore everything you lost. Hallelujah. He's going to restore your health. He's going to restore your body. He's going to restore your spirit. You're, you're, my, you're, you're the mighty man of God. That sometimes you hear me say, or you remember when you were that mighty man of God, or that mighty woman of God. He is going to restore everything that the devil has stolen. Can somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> he says, I will give you back what you lost. And so then, but you know, I, you know I'm just a question guy. Always asking questions to God. He'll tell me something. And I'm just like a little three-year-old. I'm like, but how? But why? You know, but what, how's that going to happen? You know, I, I don't see it. You know, you got, I'm just going to let show me, dude. And, uh, and so that's what I said. I said, well, how's that going to happen? And this week, man, he gave me a new answer on it. And he showed me the story of Elijah. Because Elijah is this, this prophet of God. And Elijah is in, in Jerusalem. And the children of Israel, man, they just, just go like this. Go, chick, chick. come on. Just slap him. Just give him a little slap in the face. Just pop, pop. Some of y'all ain't playing along. <laughs> this is interactive. Come on. April, I need your hand up. Well, you can take notes in a minute. Right now, you need to, do, you need to play along. <laughs> I'm going to go like this to April. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, the, the children of Israel, they're always messing up. Always messing up. And boy, it's so easy for us to just go to them. And get, what is wrong with y'all? You know, because we look at them, we're like, you know, we, we can see how God just, you know, miraculously, he's moving seas out of their way. He's feeding them with manna. You know, we're, we're complaining we can't get a good Big Mac, you know. And, and, and he's like, you know, manna's on the ground. You know, rivers are falling. Up, and we see that from them. But he's doing the same thing for us, but we don't see it. So we're always, you know, to the children of Israel, we're like, to them. But I'm, I want to do that to, to me a little bit today. Like, you know, that's what I said to God. I said, well, how are you going to restore that? And he went, Ch -ch -ch. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> and then I saw he had already been doing it. He had already been doing it, but I was so caught up in my pity party and, oh, woe is me. It's so terrible. And I couldn't see what he was doing. And so, I'll, I'll, so what we're going to have today is a little one of these, okay? So just take your neighbor and just get a hold of their chin and just go, no, don't really do that. But <laughs> now April wants to play along. Uh-huh. I see you. First Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 2. I want to share with you the story. Later on, in the third year of the drought, everybody say drought. The Lord said to Elijah, go and present yourself to King Ahab. Tell him that I will soon send rain. So Elijah went, went to appear before Ahab. So what was going on? The children of Israel were acting silly. They, they, they were ornery like we get ornery. You know, they, they know what to do, but they don't want to do it. And so what happened when they started doing wrong, and we'll find out what that was in a minute. When they started doing the wrong thing, Elijah, the Spirit of God, Elijah represents the Holy Ghost. He represents the anointing of God, was held back. And so Elijah stood before the people and said, oh, you don't want to do what's right? Here's what's going to happen. It's not going to rain for three years. And that's exactly what happened. Elijah prayed, and for three and a half years, it didn't rain. Now, you can just imagine the fallout that that would have in our economy if globally we had no rain for three years. All of those apocalyptic movies would come to pass in a moment. We'd be walking around with goggles and gas masks, and, you know, we'd be, you know, we'd, 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 we'd we wouldn't be able to afford gas because we're just trying to buy water. You can just imagine how terrible that would be. And, you know, your body can go for days without food. Some of you don't believe that. But it can go a, long, a lot longer than you think it can without food. But water, man, about three days and you're done. You know, water is a powerful thing. But, man, when you get that drink of water, if you have, you've been thirsty, like really thirsty, and you just, I just got to have some water. I, I don't usually get that thirsty. I'm, I'm, I'm good with tea. And Dr. Pepper, but I've been, I've been, I know, I've been, but I've been really thirsty. You know, a couple times when I was just like, man, I got, I don't, it doesn't happen often. 
but I've just never really been that physically thirsty. But I can imagine how it would be where nothing else will satisfy you but water. And so that's what's going on. These people are, they're, they're dying of thirst. I mean, literally, animals are dying. Crops are dying. Their people are dying because they have no water. And Elijah is told by God, go and tell the king, the rain is coming. Man, that's some exciting news. And so he goes and tells the king. And, but, you know, and so uh, and when, when I think about this and thinking about the context of, of the time of the year it is for us, the timing it is for me in my life where we are as a church, uh, a couple, couple weeks ago was our anniversary service. It was also the anniversary of a lot of bad things happening in my life. And, and so we're, we're starting a whole brand new year, a brand new beginning, new things happening. And, the, you know, and then in May, God says, man, it's going to start raining again. I'm going to restore the things the enemy has stolen from you. And then here we are. You know, he leads me to Elijah. And so it reminds me of the message I preached a year ago, almost to the day of this Sunday. And that message was called Flood the City. And in that message, we talked about a lot of stuff regionally. And I want to I catch you up, because some of you weren't here a year ago. And I, I want to catch you up to the regional drought that is going on right here. Uh, in, in, a, in a county in the United States, uh, spoiler alert, Johnson County. In Johnson County, they asked the 160,000 people that lived here in 2017, they said, what is your religious beliefs? We're talking about the, the buckle of the Bible belt, right here, right where most of us live. Our church is, all, is about, you know, half a mile from the edge of Johnson County. So right where God placed us, right where this church is, that 2017, they did, a, they did a poll and they asked people, what is your religious beliefs? The choices that aren't on the list were Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, Other, and None. Here are the findings of the 160,000 people in Johnson County. The people that selected other were 1,600 people. Some other thing. So, you know, they worship flowers or something. Uh, Catholic was 1,600 people. Protestant, if you don't know, we're Protestant. 8,000, of 160,000 people, 8,000 people said Protestant. Now, we're also evangelical, which is the next one. Evangelical will be more of the apostolic spirit move of God, Holy Ghost kind of thing. Love this number. 57,600 people of the 160,000 in this area. 57,600 people. And then we're, I'm like, woo hoo we're winning. But there's one more category. The next category is none. 88,000 people said they have no God. And they live right here. You talk about a regional drought. <laughs> Johnson County, Texas. There are 88,000 people that if you ask them, what is, the, what is their religious belief? They would say, I have none. Or at least they would say, if this is all I have to choose from, I'm not picking one of those. I would rather pick none. That survey went on. If you continue reading in that survey, then it gets really gloom. Johnson County, Texas is the third highest suicide, suicide rate in the state of Texas. Our county has the third highest suicide rate of the entire state. There are 35,000 people in Johnson County that have been diagnosed with depression, which is also the highest percentage in the, in the entire state of Texas per capita. We have more people that don't just say they're depressed, but that have been clinically diagnosed with depression live right here, 35,000 people in Johnson County. Now, if you take a map and you see where our church is and you expand out, and we did this, you expand out and you draw a circle, who could drive here in five minutes? How many people do you think that is? 
It's 5,000 people. 5,000 people live within five minutes of this location. Now, that's, we, we got to get some room. Are you with me? We need to add on because we can't fit 5,000 people in here. But the reality of that number is within five minutes of our church, 2,750 people have no religious belief at all. Of the 5,000 people within five minutes of our church, the 88,000, the portion of that, the ratio of that breaks down to 2,750 people live within five minutes of this building and have no religious belief at all. That means they have no God. They surely have no real God. That also means that there are 1,100 people living within five minutes of our church that are battling with depression. 11, 1,100 people within five minutes of this building are dealing with depression on a daily basis. See, it's easy to, uh, it's easy to come to church and see the place, you know, pretty full of people and meeting all your friends. But if there's 1,100 people within five minutes of this church that are dealing with depression, that means there's a big portion of people sitting right here that are dealing with depression. It's very possible there's people here today that really have no God. So why did God put us here? Seems to me like he handpicked the place for this church. Seems like he put us right in the right spot. Amen? Amen. Because our church is about love, hope, and healing. If there's something you need when you're depressed, you need to know that somebody loves you. I'm not talking about that Jesus love that churches have that, that'll tell you, oh yeah, Jesus loves you. And you're like, and you're like well yeah, well, can you help me like with 20 bucks? You're like, oh no, I don't love you. Jesus loves you. You know, you're on your own there. Have you ever experienced that kind of love? Well, that's not what we're doing here. You know, we're about love, hope, and healing. Man, and you need to experience the love of God. April, you did such a great job earlier. The love of God is in this house, man. And you've got to receive that. You've got to feel it. It is raining love in this place. And he is here today to break the drought off of you, off of me, off of this area. That's why we're here to bring love, hope, and healing to people. Is anybody about that besides me? Amen. Amen. You know, and I've gone through, I've, you know, this last year has been, man, it's tough. It's tough. Dry, drought, you know, scared to death, fear, fear, fearful of everything, can't make a decision, just going through depression. I didn't even know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think I, 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 I had never experienced depression. And, man, this last year just, it, can I just say this and not, you not leave? It kicked my butt. That's just the truth. But the reality is, God loves us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My personal drought is not any different probably than your drought. God is here today. He's here to reign in this place. But you've got to look at why, why in the Old Testament, what was going on? What, what were they doing that caused a three and a half year drought? See, that was my next question. Why was there no rain? Now, this, the answer to this may not be the answer to what you're going through. You know, because some things you do and other things are done to you. Some things are your fault. Some things are not your fault. But we usually get those things confused. Usually the things we should be, we should be repenting for, we're blaming somebody else for. Come on. And the things that, that we blame ourselves for is usually something that wasn't our fault. That's true. A lot of times we have this self-guilt that we put on ourselves. And we're, we, we are beating ourselves up for something that we didn't do. For some trauma that happened as a child. From some, some abuse that we suffered from a, from a mate or from, 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 a, from you know, some family member or some kind of something we've gone through. You know, some, some battle scars. Maybe a physical battle that we've been in, you know, in the military or something. And we have this, this guilt that we put on ourselves. Man, God is here today to break that shame off of us. And then there's those things that we do to ourselves that, that we, we engage in and we're a part of and, and we just want to blame everybody else for those things. But today I want to talk about some of those things. And I hope you don't get mad and you don't you know, skip church next week because you know, Gary's picking on you. Trust me, if it's coming out of my mouth, it's also gone through me and I've had to live it and I've had to deal with it. And so one of the things that God showed me this last year was the same thing these people dealt with and it was the spirit of idolatry. 
I want you to say idolatry. idolatry. Now, I know you don't have no little shrine, you know, set up in your corner of your kitchen. If you do, talk to me after service. <laughs> when you hear the word idolatry in, in 2019 in America, most of us are just like, whoa, that, you know, whew, I, I'm not, I, I might be doing some stuff wrong, but I ain't doing that. Well, hello, hang on. 1 Kings 18, verses 17 through 18. Ahab saw Elijah come, and Elijah went to him, and they began to talk, and he said, hey, man, uh, you know, I'm, rain is coming. And this is Ahab's response. When Ahab saw Elijah, he exclaimed, so is it really you, troublemaker of Israel? Isn't it funny how Elijah had rain where he was? You know, ravens are bringing him food. Widows are supplying his needs. He's by the, he's by the brook, and water's coming. But where Ahab was, there was no rain. Elijah still had some of the residual from the rain, and Ahab, when he sees Elijah, when he sees the man of God, when, when it's, to put this in our terms, when we see God and troubles going, what we want to do is blame God, and that's exactly what Ahab does. He says to, he says to Elijah, he says, what are you doing here, you troublemaker of Israel? Man, we got to get this straight. If you got trouble in your life, it is not God. Come on, I want you to say this. Say, if there's trouble in my life, it is not God. Don't blame God. Maybe blame me. <laughs> not me. You. <laughs> I have to blame me, right? The reality is, if there's trouble in my life, you know, God will allow trouble, but he never puts trouble on you. Because what happens is, when we start doing the wrong thing, we step out of God's covering. And when we step out of God's covering, you are on your own. And that's a terrible place to be. Because I don't know about you, but you can't make it rain. I know y'all think you can. I'm making it rain. No, you ain't. You're thinking you can. You just got a bunch of ones you're shooting out there anyway. So he says, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? Elijah answers, I have made no trouble for Israel. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. There it is. Idolatry. One of the Ten Commandments. Y'all can help me remember, because I just can't remember where that one's at on the list. But one of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Anybody know which one that one is? Thank you, Megan. It's the very first one. Good job, Megan. It's the very first one. Maybe God's trying to tell us something. You know, we look at that first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. We're like, oh, we got that covered. Let's move on to number two. But maybe, just maybe, there's some idols in our lives. You see, in our life, sin produces drought, both physically and spiritually. And when there's sin in your life, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause drought. It's going to cause a dryness. You know, the prayer that God hears from the sinner is, God, forgive me. He doesn't hear the prayers of, oh, God, just bless me. Because God's not going to bless your mess. You need to write that down. God ain't going to bless your mess. Because you see, when God blesses something, it's going to grow. And he's not going to fertilize your poop. <laughs> Somebody's preaching now. <laughs> just saying. You know, you, you can't be like do, dealing drugs and say, oh, God, bless my drug empire. I bet you there's drug dealers that do that, though. I bet there is, because they're deceived. You know, it's easy to point fingers at them, but he's not going to bless your mess. He wants to get you out of your mess. Sometimes the reason he's allowed the mess is to wake you up. You know, the Bible says it's the goodness of God that brings men to repentance. Now, you can still, I, I just feel like i got to say this. might regret it later, but uh, you, can, you can feel like, you know, well, I, God's still blessing me. But it's very possible what you're receiving is the residual things that you planted when you were living for God. And now those blessings have spilled over to when you started messing up. And you think, well, see, if, 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 God, if God was mad at me, he'd quit blessing me. No, God is truthful and he's faithful to his word. And sometimes the blessings you're receiving today in the middle of a mess are simply because you planted good seeds before and that crop is coming. But you're planting a really bad crop right now. And it's very possible and it will come to pass because God is not a liar. Amen? Amen. I don't know. The devil lies all the time, but God doesn't. Sin produces both physical and spiritual deadness and dryness. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses, verse 5. This is what the Lord says. What did your ancestors find wrong with, with, 
Oh, oh let, me, let me give you some, some text for this. Uh, there is a, just found this this week. There, I've seen it, but I've ne- never found these scriptures before. Uh, there is a principle in the Old Testament where when the children of Israel start doing the wrong thing, man, there's this dryness that comes on the land, on the ground, where cr- crops don't grow and those kind of things. So Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 5, I'm going to give you two or three of these verses that, that back this up. This says, this is what the Lord says. What, what did your ancestors find wrong with me that led them to stray so far away from me? They, they worshipped worthless idols only to become worthless themselves. Wow. That's a, that is a, that's one of those slaps in the face right there. They begin to worship worthless idols only to become worthless themselves. Is it hot in here or is it just me? Is it the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. Just make sure that thing's on 69 or 50 or something, man. The, the truth of the matter is, I want, to, I, want to, I, want to, I want to show you the good thing of God. Even in this, it says only become worthless themselves because what he's telling us is we become like the thing we worship. The reason I've got to talk to you about idolatry is because we become like the thing we worship. If you worship your job, you're going to become like your job. You're going to be just like everybody else at your job. If you worship, if every picture you take has a Budweiser in it, you're going to become just like a Budweiser. You're going to look just like that. And I don't, I, I, I'm not going to take the time for that. Anyway, I'm moving on. The reality is we become like what we worship. And so that's what he says. You, be, you, you worship worthless idols only to become worse, worthless yourself. Man, that's, that is an awakening scripture. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. He says, go west. Go west and look in the land of the Cyprus. Go east and search through the land of Kedar. Has anyone, listen, listen at the perplexity that God is thinking when we turn our back on him. He says, has anyone ever heard of anything as strange as this? You know, go and look. Has any, ever, has any nation ever traded its God for new ones? Even though they are not gods at all. Yet my people exchange their glorious God for the worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such things. Listen to these words. The heavens are shocked at such things. The stars, the the moon, the sun, the clouds, the heavens are shocked at the way we behave and they shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me the fountain of living water. Man, that's not just something he's randomly saying. He's trying to show us that when we, when we turn our back on God in any area of our life, He is going to shut up the heavens. The heavens revolt. The heavens, the physical sky revolts and says, how in the world could you turn your back on such a glorious God? The fountains of living water revolt. And, they, and that's the first thing they did. They turned their, way, the, their hearts away from the, fountain, the God that gives the fountains of living water. And the second thing, look, look at this. And they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. A cistern is not a well. A cistern is usually built like in these old houses. A cistern was built where it would catch the runoff that was on the roof from the rain. So when the rain would come, they would dig this cistern and they would have the guttering system. You know, we, we, we call it, it's like recycling water now. You know, it's like these catch pails, you know. That's what we call them now. Well, back then it was called a cistern. You would dig a hole in the ground. It may be only, only be 8, 10 feet deep. And they would line it with brick or something. They would line it and it would hold water. But it was not a well. You could go to it and you could, you might have the bucket on top and you might have the little, you know, fancy little, you let the bucket down and you wick, 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 and you pull it back up, you know, that little kind of thing. You might have that and it's be, oh, we got a well. You ain't got no well. You're just catching runoff. A well comes from deep, deep, deep in the ground. If you're going to have a well, somebody say, you got to dig for it. Come on, if you're going to have a well, you got to dig. And, you know, if you didn't want to dig it, you just like, well, we got the well off there. We're just going to put a, we're just going to have a canteen in the backyard. That's what a cistern is. But then he says, what you've done is you've given up the well of living water to drink from a cracked, leaking cistern. What that tells me is no matter what you put in it, it will never be enough. No matter what you try to, to, to work up on your own. Man, have you ever got to a place where, you know, you, you just can't make enough money? You ever got where you just can't produce enough joy to be happy? 
You ever got to a point, you, you realize, man, I got to have God. I have, I mean, I don't know about you. Maybe it's just me, but I can't make it with you. You might look at my life and say, oh, Gary, he's got it so easy. He's cushy. You know, he's got his little dogs. He's got his little car. He's, you know, he's just got everything you need. I can't make it without God. I don't care about, I mean, I do care about my dogs, but I don't care about any of that other stuff. Man, I got to have God. You see, when we turn our backs on God, even nature revolts. The heavens are shocked and they shrink back in dismay. The ground around us becomes dry and barren. And if we are stubborn and we don't want to give every part of our life to God, what we will do, whether you know it or not, you will build, you will dig a cistern. You'll dig this place to try to hold on to the little bit you have. And it has a hole in it and it will always be dry. Hosea chapter 2 verse 3. This is God speaking. I will strip her as naked as she, was, as she was on the day she was born. I will leave her to die of thirst as in a dry and barren wilderness. Let's just stop a second. I can feel y'all, some of y'all getting depressed. You got, man, Pastor Gary, there's already like 35,000 people that got clinical depression. Now there's 35,000 in one because you just really ruined my day. <laughs> Let's just take, take a second. The reality is, if we do it our own way, we will fail. But that's why we have Him. That's why we have Christ. That's why we have a cross. Because we are not left with these broken, cracked cisterns that won't hold anything. We have a God that will set us free. We have a God. Oh, let's just take a minute. Can you just lift your hands and just say, Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for an answer. Thank you, God, no matter how dry I am, maybe even today. God, I thank you that there's an answer. I thank you, God, you're not going to leave me alone. So 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 19 to 21. Remember, it hasn't rained for three years. Elijah goes to the king, and he says, man, God's fixing to bring some rain. You better get ready. And Elijah's like, I mean, you know, Ahab's blaming him. You know, God doesn't care if you blame him. He's still going to do what he's going to do. He's still going to love you. Just like, he don't care if you blame him. You know, you can be all mad at God all you want to. Man, when you get, to, when you get your life right, he's going to start blessing you whether you believe in him or not. And so here we go. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 19 through 21. This is how they're going to get the rain back. And this is, I've read this story a hundred times. I've never really put in the context of it's a drought. But in the middle of a drought, here's what it says. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 19. Elijah says, now summon all Israel to join me at Mount Carmel along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asheron, who are supported by Jezebel. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets of Mount Carmel, to Mount Carmel. Then Elijah stood between them and he said, How much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. So He's, he, he goes to them and he says, look, because of your sin for three and a half years, we haven't had any rain. The rain's about to come. And so he gets the people together to show them the power of God. And what they bring to the table is the prophets of Baal. They bring the idol worshipers to this thing. And they have this little contest on this mountain. And so they get, they, you know, the, the way... Elijah would sacrifice, he would take a bull, and they would cut it in two, and they would put it on this stone altar, and they would, you know, put, put uh, boards on it, and they would uh, light it on fire, and they would sacrifice this bull to God, and it would be a sign of surrender, and, and it, you know, there was a cost in it, there was, it was a sign of our repentance, it was a sign of, of how we go to God, and, and we're broken, and we're, and we're marred, and we, we go to God, and he forgives us of our sins, and, and so that's what they were going to do, but Elijah, he puts a little twist in there, he says, bring me your gods, and let's see if your gods are better than the Jehovah God, and so they bring these 950 people, and they, he tells them, he goes, okay, you guys get to go first, whoever, 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 I'll get it out in a minute. Who, who's? Who, whose God answers first with fire will be the winner. I love a good contest, don't you? And so the prophets of Baal go first. And so they start in the morning and they start, you know, praying. They kill their bull. And they start praying. Of course, you know, you know what's happening. Nothing's happening. And then, but then it says, as the, is their custom, they begin to cut themselves. 
you know, oh, God, hear us. And, you know, Baal, hear us. And they're cutting their arms and they're cutting themselves and they're bleeding and, and making a show. And, and it, this goes on for a while. It gets to like noontime. And, and then Elijah, man, he is just poking fun at these people because he knows he's not sweating it. He knows their God ain't going to do nothing. And so, so it's going on and on. And so Elijah's like, you know, maybe, maybe your God can't hear real well. You know, I mean, after all, he's made out of stone. So maybe you should, you know, scream real loud. And so he's you just antagonizing him. You know, maybe he's, he says, you know, maybe, maybe. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe you need to wake him up. And, and, and then he's like, well, you know what? Probably, he's probably on vacation. He'll be back next week. I mean, he even says to them, your God might be in the bathroom. That's what he says. I didn't make this stuff up. You can't make this up. That's what he says. Maybe your God's in the bathroom. He'll be out in a few minutes. That's what he says. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, he's just poking. It goes on all day until the evening sacrifice. And then the evening sacrifice, Elijah's like, okay. It's my turn. Y'all get out of the way. And so he takes the stones and he repairs the altar. He rebuilds this altar. He puts it the way it's supposed to be. He takes 12 stones and each one of those stones is in the right place. And it's because it's, it represents the 12 tribes of Israel. He takes this, this, this bull and he, he cuts its throat and he sacrifices it. You know, that's really what today is about for us. It's a sacrifice. It's a time to go to God and say, you know, I just want to make sure I'm right. Because there's a whole neighborhood that needs the power of God. There's a whole neighborhood. I've got to get this right not just for me. I've got to get, the, I got to get this right for these 88,000 people that don't even know who God is. And so that he kills this bull and he puts it on the wood on, on the altar. and He digs this ditch around it. And then he tells him, he goes, go get some water. Remember, it's a drought. He says, go get water. And so they make four trips with three jars, three large jars of water, and they pour 12 large buckets of water on this sacrifice. And then Elijah steps back, and just with a simple prayer. I mean, the, Bible, the Bible says that it's so wet that it's filled up the trench that they put around the altar. And Elijah steps back, and just with a simple prayer, says, God, that these people would know that you're real. Let fire fall from heaven. And that's exactly what happens. The Bible says that fire fell from heaven. It not only consumed the sacrifice, it not only burned up all the wood, it burned up all the rocks, and it also burned up all the water. I mean, there was no question. You know, and that, what that tells me is God was waiting. He wasn't going to just halfway show a little, you know, little firecracker. Man, he was going to be like, I'm going to show you who God is. Not only has he been holding back the fountains of the water, but he's also been holding back his anointing. Man, if there is something we need today, it's not just the freshness of God. We need the anointing of God. We need that devil stomping, devil rebuking, cancer killing, you know, from the dead raising anointing of God. Can somebody say amen? amen. We don't just need a little tingle down my spine. Let me feel like I've been to church. I need some power coming out of my hands. You need some power coming out of your hands, out of your mouth, that when you speak, the devil's like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. I'm in, and the devil starts running away. That's what we need, amen? amen. And so he prayed this prayer, and fire, 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 from, fire, fire fell from heaven. He brings us to 1 Kings 18, verse 40. Then Elijah commanded, listen to this. Then Elijah commanded, seize all the prophets of Baal. Don't let a single one escape. So the people, somebody say the people. So the people, not Elijah. So the people gathered up all the prophets of Baal. They went to their idols that they had been worshiping, and they gathered them up, and they took them to another location, and they killed them there. It's time for us to kill some idols in our life. I know I'm running out of time, but i got to get this in. It takes repentance and sacrifice to receive an anointing. I want you to say it. It's going to cost me. I'm going to have to repent. And I'm going to have to sacrifice to receive an outpouring. See, here's the truth, though. God put you here. He didn't just put a building here. He didn't just put me here. He put us here for those people that need us. And that tells me you can do it. That tells me you can repent. It tells me you can sacrifice. I can repent. I can sacrifice. And God will show up. Amen? Amen. What's repentance? Everybody just say quit it. That's what it means. Just quit it. Just tell somebody, just tell that person next to you, say quit it. Quit it. But the sacrifice is the hard part. Because, see, we can always quit it for about five minutes. You know, I mean, a drug addict, you know, 
He, he quit it right after he put that needle in his arm. I ain't doing it no more. Right? But the sacrifice is the hard part. Because we can quit it, but then the sacrifice is when, when the desire comes back. And that's where it gets tough. But wh what I've discovered, when you repent, it gives you the ability to sacrifice. When you say, God, I'm going to stop. I'm going to quit this. And if you'll go to God, he will give you the ability to walk away. Well, I got a few little things I want to share with you. I know Josh is up here. Josh, I'm glad you're on stage. Got a question for you. Do you have an idol? I'm going to help us. My personal notes God gave me. Do you have an idol? How to know if you have an idol? An idol is anything you turn to in order to receive the things Christ died to provide. An idol is anything you turn to to receive things that God died to provide. So it, things he died to provide is peace, joy, healing, physical and spiritual and emotional healing. If you're going anywhere else to get those things, freedom, rest, Sleep, financial blessings. Those are things that God died to provide. If you're going to a substance or an activity or a person to receive any of those things, it's an idol. Yeah, I thought it was like this little carved statue on my fireplace. No. Let me read this again. An idol is anything you turn to in order to receive the things God, the, the things Christ died to provide. This, that's a big list. Peace. Sleep. And I just feel like I need to say this again. Sleep. What do you turn to to sleep? We blame it on I'm getting old, my back hurts. If I can just, you know, have two good shots of tequila, then I can sleep. No, that's an idol. I just got to watch four hours of television, then I can sleep. No, God died so that you could have rest and peace. That you could enter into his rest. And so if you turn to something else, that's an idol. Once again, this is a list God gave me. This is how he revealed me, the idols in my life. God asked me, when was the last time you heard from me? This is how you know if you have an idol. When was the last time you heard from God? I mean really heard from God. I don't mean the last time, you know, you was listening to something on KLTY and you felt a little you know, tingle start at the back of your head and you go, woo, I feel God. I'm not talking about that. When was the last time you know you heard from God? You're not going to like this. That's why I make the big bucks. You know you have an idol if you don't read your Bible regularly. Something, you're, you're getting your wisdom, you're getting your answers, you're getting what you need from somewhere else. I don't know what that idol is, but if you're not reading your Bible regularly, it's because you have an idol somewhere else really not going to like this one. You know you have an idol if you don't have a consistent prayer life. And I'll just be really bold right here and tell you, if you don't have a consistent prayer life, my friend, you are your own idol. Your brain, your mindset, I've got it all figured out. I'm going to worry about it till it fixes itself. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm just going to deal with it. No, if you don't have a consistent prayer life, chances are you're your own idol. I'm going to keep going. You still love me? Three people do. Praise God. Two questions to help you discover what your idol is. What in your life takes God's place? Girl, I thought we were talking about reaching this area. We're going to do revival services. And people are going to get saved. They ain't coming here till we get right. We don't need them to come here until we get right or we will mess them up. You know the reason why 88,000 people wouldn't pick Christianity is because we have made a mockery of Christianity. 
we check in at the uprising on Sunday and we check in at the club on Friday. Well, hallelujah. You can hate me or love me, but it's true. You know you have an idol when something else takes God, God's place. Here's another way, another question you can ask yourself to, to discover your idol. What do you turn to for the things that only God provides? What do you go to? I'm telling you, God is serious about this. This is two months of my life. He said to me, you know it's an idol if you must defend it. I know I need to quit this, but if you justify it, if there's a behavior in your life, there's part of your life that you have to justify and defend, it's an idol. People keep saying I need to quit, but they just don't understand. If you have to defend it, you see, God needs no defense. When I say to you, I'm just going to pray, ain't nobody going, well, you don't need to pray. I don't ever have to say to you, well, you know, I know it's not going to work, but I'm just going to pray. I don't have to defend prayer. You don't have to defend God, and God doesn't need you to defend Him. You know it's an idol if it takes you away from God. If it takes you away from His presence. If it takes you away from His people. If it takes you away from praying or reading the Word. If it takes you away from worship. If it takes you away from His house. If it takes you away from anything to do with God, it's an idol. You see, idol's goal is to put you in a barren place. The purpose of an idol is to get you so dry that you give up on God. You know it's an idol if it wants to isolate you. If you find yourself feeling awkward around God's people, it's because there's an idol in your life. If when you're with it, you're happy and you're all, woo even though you know your life is a disaster, but then when you get around God's people, you feel a little awkward, it's because there's an idol and that idol's not at home here. It's not, not at home here. Anybody can come in, but the idol causes you to feel that way you know it's an idol this is a big one you know it's an idol if it showed up when your guard was down when I was writing notes about on this a while back what I first wrote was you know it's an idol when it comes when it when times are tough but that's not true idols cause tough times idols come when you're just a little tired You'll set an idol up when you just had a fight with your wife. An idol will come when, when it's not really good. Let me put it this way. Lukewarm water is the breeding ground for idols. If you're hot and on fire for God, idols have no place in your life and they know they can't show up. But when you quit reading, when you quit praying, when you get a little cold in your walk with God, not cold, cold, but you're just kind of not bad, it's not good. You just put it this way. You put your guard down. When you put your guard down, that's when the enemy starts filching from you and taking just a little, just a little, just a little. So you know it's an idol if it showed up when your guard was down. Things weren't really good. Things weren't really bad. Idols are just waiting for you to be tired. Hear these words. Idols are waiting for you to be tired, hurt, offended, wounded, complacent, depressed, shameful. And then they introduce themselves and reproduce like a virus on steroids. You know it's an idol if you've compromised God's law to keep it. You know it's an idol if you've compromised if God's, if God's word says don't do it and you're doing it, it's an idol. You know it's an idol if you've compromised God's law to keep it. I know the Bible says it's wrong, but you know it's an idol if it pleases your flesh at the expense of your spirit, spirit man. You know it's an idol if it pleases your flesh at the expense of your spirit man. You know it's an idol if it used to give you happiness, but now that same thing is a burden to carry around. You know it's an idol if it used to make you happy, 
but now it's a burden. The last one. You know it's an idol if it came into your mind when I first started talking about what an idol is. You know it's an idol if you're already thinking what it is. God's already, because you see, He's revealing it to you. There's things in your life you got to lay down. The saying in our society is, I'm not hurting anybody. What a lie. What a lie. Because if you don't, if you don't go to heaven, that means there's going to be other people that were depending on you that may not go to heaven. Your behavior hurts a lot of people. And in the corporate setting of the uprising, we need everyone. We need everyone. You need to have the Spirit of God flowing through you, touching those dry places that you go in. Because there's a whole lot of people around here that just need a ride to church, but most of them need some hope. They need some love. Let's go back to our story for just a minute. So Elijah tells Ahab, going to rain but he stands on the mountain and he calls for fire is that strange to anybody but just me Elijah tells Ahab he tells the people get ready because it's going to rain but when he prays he prays for fire you see it's because I said earlier God's not going to bless your mess So what God needs to do is He needs to bring some fire. Fire represents purification. It represents sacrifice. It represents that moment He gives us to get right with Him because fire has to come first because the rain is coming. The rain is coming. He's already told us. I started this message up. God is going to give us back everything we lost. He wants to give you back everything you lost. The rain is coming. And so the way we prepare for the rain is we have to have the fire. We have to have the fire to come and burn up all the junk. The fire comes and it it cleans us up. It cleans out our heart. It takes all those evil, bad, dark, dirty seeds and it burns them up. Because if rain comes, if the blessing of God comes, and I'm full of porn and I'm full of lust and I'm full of anger and I'm full of hate, man, God's word is true. When it rains, it's going to rain. And rain, when rain falls, things are going to grow. And he doesn't want to make you worse off. So what he does, when, when he says rain's coming, he first of all sends fire. I know some of you are very disappointed in this message today. It's okay, because rain is coming, and I'm just trying to get us ready. Rain is coming. This area is going to change. God is going to move in this region, and it's going to be because of us, because we heard the call. We heard God say, get ready. Rain's coming, and we fell on our face, and we began to reap and pray before God, and we said, God, forgive me. Take my idols away. So they kill these prophets of Baal. Then Elijah goes. I don't have time to read it to you. Elijah goes to the top of a mountain. He bows his head between his knees, the Bible says. And he prays and he says, Okay, God, we're ready. Send the rain. God, we're ready. Send the rain. And his servant's with him. And Elijah's praying. He tells the servant, Go to the edge of the cliff and look out over the horizon and see if you see rain. See, and this is what's going to begin to happen the next few weeks for us. The, the, the servant's going to go and he's going to come back and he's going to say, Man, Elijah, I'm sorry, I don't see any rain. This is exactly what we're going to go through the next few weeks. I'm prophesying, I'm telling you, we're going to see rain, we're going to see revival. And some of you are going to be like, I don't see it yet. Elijah keeps praying. He says, Go again comes back every time go again nothing man Elijah it is bone dry there's not a cloud in the sky but somebody say on the seventh time (laughs) you see on the perfect time on the completed time the servant goes to the valley or to the to the edge of the cliff and he looks over the valley and he runs back to Elijah and he says oh Elijah I see a cloud and it's the size of a man's hand that doesn't sound too exciting. But it's something, right? I see a cloud and it's, it's the size of a man's hand. And Elijah says these words. 
we got to get off this mountain because I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. <laughs> I'm telling you, I hear the sound of the abundance. I'm, I'm not Elijah. I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. It may just look like today there's a hundred and some people here, but let me tell you something. I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. We have got to get ready. I want you to stand up with me. It's a tiny little cloud, but it represents our future. Bow your heads. What is the idol in your life? What is the idol in your life? Are you really going to go there? Yes, I'm going to go right there. You see, God is here to heal you. He's here to deliver you. There, there's some emotional things that are going on in a lot of us. There's depression. There's these burdens. There's these heaviness. But what it really comes down to is we're dry. And it's because we have idols. I know there's other things that can cause us to have situations. But if God is revealing an idol to you today, I'm going to count to three. And when I do, I want you to get out of your seat and bring it to the front. Let's say that again. If God has revealed an idol to you, man, don't leave and keep that. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to shelter it. Don't try to defend it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. If there's an idol in your life, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. But if there's an idol in your life that you say, man, God is talking to me about getting rid of this. He's not just revealing it to just reveal it. He's revealing it so he can kill it, so he can destroy it once and for all. And when he does, the healing virtue of God is going to flow through this room. When, he, when, he, when, when you bring it to God, I'm telling you that, 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 that thing that you can't sleep and you're taking drugs to sleep, that thing that you can't be happy, He's going to put joy in its place. When you slay that idol, God is going to restore to you everything that was taken. Hallelujah. So I'm going to count to three and you got to be bold, you got to be brave, but you're going to get out of your seat and you're going to come to the front. And you better hope there's room for you because I know everybody's coming. So one... God, I thank you. I thank you, God, for your delivering power. Lord, you're not just going to kill the idols today, but you're going to free us from the drought. Two, Lord, we're done with it. We're sick and tired of defending it. We're tired of supplying its need. We're, we're tired, God, of the things it has taken from us. One, two, three. Lord, we stand, we kneel before you today. Lord, and we ask for forgiveness. Lord, forgive us. Lord, break our heart for what breaks your heart. Whatever it is, man, when you get to the front, just say, God, I give it to you. I give it over to you. You might need, you might need to say its name, but God, I give it over to you. Lord, I'm tired, tired of dealing with it. God, forgive me. Probably about 10 more of you that have an addiction in your life and you're sitting in your seat with it. I'm telling you, God is here not just... I, I hear people, my, I, hear, I hear the enemy saying to over you, man, you've been, for, you've been for prayer for this before and you still got it. I'm telling you, this is the opportunity. This is your moment. This is your moment. Don't stay that. I've, I've tried it before and it didn't work. Man, God is here today to deliver you and set you free. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Free. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, I thank you, God. I thank you for deliverance and freedom in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, you get to the front and say, God, I give it over to you. God, forgive me. Forgive me, God, for supplying its need. Forgive me, God, for taking care of it. Forgive me, God, for worshiping something else and not worshiping you. God, forgive me. God, I choose to give it to you. God, I kill this idol today in Jesus' name. And man, when, when you get to that point, it's time to lift your hands and say, God, fill me. 
fill me, God. Lord, I thank you for the rain is falling. I thank you, God, that your rain is falling today. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I, I curse the curse in Jesus' name. I break it off in the mighty name of heaven. Lord, I thank you for freedom. I thank you for freedom. Lord, your word declares, He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, my shadow. Kukitaramoko. Greg, I hear the Lord say, I'm restoring the childhood that you lost. I am restoring the, 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 I don't know, there was an experience that you had with God as a really young boy, and the enemy stole that from you. You may not know much about it, but I, I, did, I sense in the Spirit you sitting in your room and you praying to God, and then the enemy came and he stole some of that relationship. God says, I'm not just restoring what you lost the last few weeks, the last few months, but I'm restoring everything you've lost in your entire life, and I'm restoring the things that you never were able to receive because the enemy took them before they got there. Lord, I thank you, God, for a complete work in Greg's life. I thank you, God, for a complete work. Lord, restore his joy. Restore his rest. Restore his peace in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you that the rain is coming. Come on, somebody help me worship God. Lord, I thank you that the rain is coming. I thank you, God, that the rain is coming. I thank you that the rain is coming. I thank you that the rain is coming. In Jesus' mighty name, the lies that the enemy tells you and says you're not worthy, says that you're not loved, says that you're not enough, I curse that in Jesus' name. God says you are more than enough. You are more than enough. You don't have to do anything. Man, Jordan, I just sense that you, 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 unknowingly, you've set up things to help people to like you, to be maybe more socially acceptable or whatever that, that seems to be in your life. But God says you don't need anything. You just be you. You just be you. You are my chosen vessel. You are that beautiful flower in my garden. You are the one that I handpicked. You are the one that, 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 I, that I come to in the middle of the night and I sing over. You are the one when you felt unloved, I speak those words. I love you. I love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you, God. Lord God, for just freshing, fresh anointing, fresh fire in her life. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you. It is a time. It is a time that you're going to flood this city. Lord, it is a time that you're going to flood this city with your anointing. Lord, begin it here. Begin it here. Let this place be wet with the anointing of heaven. Begin it here, God. Begin it here, God. Right here, Lord. Right here. Begin it in my heart. Right here in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, shoramoku kiramoshotamaha. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. But I don't want to rush this, man. God is doing something in your heart. God is doing something in your life right now. Lord, I thank you, God. Lord, I th come against the, 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 uh, the attack of addiction. Lord God, and I declare, I declare over those with addictions in this house, God, they're not going to have to go dry out somewhere. They're not going to have to, God, go seek some kind of medical attention. God, but you are going to physically heal their body in Jesus' name. Lord, heal the disease of addiction in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I thank you, God, that as some of our men and women, they go, to, they go to NA and they go to AA. God, they're going to go and they're going to be a light, God, instead of just being a dark hole. God, they're going to go and they're going to walk in and they're going to be a bearer of light in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for an addiction recovery group being started right here on top of this hill, right here, God, in the uprising. God, I thank you for an addiction recovery group being started here. Lord, I prophesy that in Jesus' mighty name. I call it to pass in Jesus' mighty name. I thank you, God, Lord, for de de depression recovery. Lord, right here in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Lord God, divorce recovery, depression recovery, God, drug recovery. God, let it start right here on this hill in Jesus' mighty name. I thank you, God. I thank you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Lord, we just give you glory. We give you praise. 
Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you, Lord. Lord, the rain is coming. Hallelujah, Lord. The rain is coming. Hallelujah, Lord. The rain is coming. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. ask you to make a commitment today to make a commitment today for the next I'm just going to say six months because I don't have a good time frame for the next six months commit to not missing church commit to that if it's at all possible I know things happen but if it is at all possible commit to not missing church because there's going to be a Sunday that the fire of God is going to fall like you've never seen before when God says the future glory is greater than the former glory let me tell you he's talking to me and I've seen some pretty crazy stuff and so if it's going to be better than that you don't want to miss it and the second part of that is this you're a part of it you're a part of it I want you to say that to yourself say I'm a part of it you're a part of it we need you There's people that are going to start coming that you're going to be able to witness to. I can't pray for everybody. There's going to be people that are going to come that you're going to have a word for. you got to be here. So for the next six months, do not miss church. If it is earthly possible to be here, let me say it, if it's heavenly possible to be here, you need to be here six months. And by then, you won't miss for nothing. (laughs) We'll have to make you, we'll have to put on a rotation. Hallelujah. He speaks some final words over you. If you're dealing with an addiction, I know God is setting you free today. If that's you, just on the inside, shake your head. If you're dealing with an addiction, God has set you free today. There's people in this church that will help you. will walk that out. Come and talk to me. I'll put you with the right people. If you've got physical ailments in your body, God is healing you today. On the inside, maybe on the outside. Shake your head. You need, if you need a healing, a physical healing, raise your hand. Andy, put your hand up for me. Hallelujah. If you need a physical healing, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord God, in the mighty name of Jesus, let that water, let that rain begin to fall. Lord, let that, fall, let that rain begin to fall. Lord, you said in the book of Acts, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Lord, let it pour out on all flesh, on all of us. Lord, let that that healing power, let it fall in us right now. Man, I just I just feel that. I feel lighter. I just feel that burden falling off in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. If you, if you deal with not being able to sleep at night, if you have trouble sleeping at night, let me see those hands. Lord, in the mighty name of heaven, Lord, I release your rest. Your rest on us in Jesus' name. Lord, let your rest be our portion. Lord, I thank you for us being able to fall asleep. Lord, and then those of us that can't stay asleep. Lord, I just thank you, God, that it's going to take our alarm clock to wake us up. In Jesus' mighty name. I claim, Lord, that's a blessing of heaven. That's not, that's not something that the devil gives us. That's a blessing from heaven. And we claim that in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, thank you so much for being here today. If it is your first time or you filled out the, the guest card, uh, Tracy will be out for you if you turn that into her. We've got a special gift for you. And then we're all going to go to Cain. If, you're, if, you, if you want to take growth track, we're going to suspend that for the month of July. We're going to hit it again in August. So no growth track today. But today we'll be at Cain's in Burleson for lunch. Raising Cain. Yeah, is that right? Yes, Raising Cain. That's right across kind of catty corner from Walmart. Uh, go, I'd love to get to have lunch with you, man. Come and hang out with us. Cane's today, church Wednesday night. Love you guys. Be blessed. Have an amazing week. Expect the rain to fall. Amen? Amen. Say what I love.